Okay, good. Okay, so um, I actually asked one of my fellow, interestingly, uh, he's from, originally from India, his dad, actually is a cardiologist in, uh, in Dubai. I, I did not know until uh, he was accepted in the program. Um, so this is the EKG of a patient. And uh, so let's see, Rafik Bai always mentions and also mentioned today, over calling and under calling. So just, we need to be just right, but it is okay. Answering EKG in the exam, I tell the fellows is one thing. The best thing about EKG at bedside, you have the patient and correlate with the patient. Please correlate with the patient. So this is the patient came in um, and then EKG. Anyone wants to give a differential? So it looks like sinus, right bundle, lead AVR, ST elevation, and then deep ST depression in the precordial leads, right? And then look at the inferior, the lead three, clearly ST elevation, right? So what do they comment? You're, you're, uh, you're muted. The basic rule, if you have QAB only in one lead, it, it doesn't count. You have I, to have QAB in two contiguous leads at least. Yeah. And, but importantly, the, the, I mean, that is the inferior story. But look at the uh, precordial, and I need to convince the year attending that this is not a STEMI, or it is a STEMI. I want to take to the cath lab. Uh, whenever we check about ST segment elevation, the point is you have to count it from the ST junction, 80 millisecond uh, discharge. And if we consider that, then the ST, uh, the, the changes are not that marked. Is part of the right bundle branch block connection delay. For the V1, probably we can say, but the AVR is worrisome and ST yes. depression is there. So it is abnormal, but the clinical context is very important. And this is the clinical context. Cardiac arrest, PA arrest, and patient is known to have ischemic cardiomyopathy, cabbage, end stage renal disease, and then came to us following the cardiac arrest. Uh, what is the level of potassium? Okay, so potassium, and then look at the acidosis. Acidosis, yes. And then look at the chest x-ray. So, uh. and the temperature was 102. So it is important to give a differential because you know, in the COVID time, we, we realized that hypoxia, acidosis, AVR, ST elevation, and it, it may look like it's a left main multivessel, but it may not be. Just metabolic abnormality can give you that. And then we did not take to the cath lab, all corrected. And as was pointed out, now it is clear that the ST abnormality in the V1 was part of the RVB, but the ST depression is much better. And the uh, thing is that, uh, Hafiz Bhai, when you have a bundle branch block pattern, right bundle branch block in complete or complete, then the AVR ST elevation doesn't count. AVS, I agree, but if there is a profound ST depression, in the other side, then it is difficult to ignore. So, um, so anyway, this patient uh, ultimately uh, um, could not make it because yes. we actually found EKG before he coded, potassium went up and, and the patient died. Um, another of Srovik Bay is here. This patient is in the floor and had an EKG and then they are asking that, what do you think about the white complex tacky in the middle of the EKG? 
So two questions. One is baseline rhythm, and then in the middle, what is happening? If you look at the rhythm strip, then lead two, it completely changes axis when it goes into a tacky. So we read it as atrial fibrillation baseline and non-sustained VT. And they are asking that the that what we do next. What was the clinical scenario? Okay, so this is the part I like. I love Wadu. Always ask the clinical scenario. Don't don't jump. And this is the part we are as a clinician. Look at this. Patient has uh, metastasis, intracranial mass, <laughs> and then this happened. You know, and we need to be realistic. And sometimes the Primary doctors, they forget to ask these questions and they expect too much from us. So we said, do LIA, LIA, leave it alone. Okay, um, can you go back to the first ECG, please? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, first of all, the uh, for the audience, uh, we need to determine what is the baseline. It's very difficult to determine from the beginning of the recording, but if you look at the end of the recording in lead two, it's very irregular and there is no P wave. So it's actual fibrillation. So no question is that this, after the fourth bit, the QRS morphology changes and there is a degree of irregularity. And one can always argue that this is actual fibrillation with rate-related bundle bind block. But then you look at lead two. If you look at lead two, if it aberrated right bundle or left bundle, the pattern should not be like this. It changes completely, number one. The other thing that quickly look at lead V2. If you look from the beginning of the QRS to the deepest point of S wave, it is more than 100 millisecond. And that goes with the VT. So these are the th quick, I mean, I, I, I thought that we should get something out of this, that this is a common yeah. question yeah. that we get asked, is it apparent conduction? And the other thing that you have to look at, to get apparent conduction, you normally you require a long short sequence, but we don't have that long short sequence here. So why would this, uh, the first bit suddenly become aberrant? So all those criteria is non-sustainability. Of course, I mean, and, the treatment, and the, this and is the all axis, the axis changed and then RR interval is very regular in the yeah. episode, in the in the middle of this yes, when the, the rr problem, interval is irregular yeah somebody with metastatic cancer they should not be unmonitored we always face this problem and then they get non sustained vt what do you do with this this patient it will be a blessing unfortunately if the patient develops vf and something yeah. happens to him um, yeah. But we always get questions about it. But then again, that as a physician, it is my job when they call me to calm the family and the referring physician down. Because when they are asking my opinion, I have to give them an opinion. They are not as always asking for solution. Remember that when physicians consult us, they are also asking for support to support their own decision. And my job as an electrophysiology consultant, I'll go and talk to the patient, I'll talk to the family, I'll talk to the referring doctor and convince them, look, this patient has metastatic cancer and I don't think it is a good idea to do anything. But when you do that, you have to spend time with the family and get a good relationship with them. And that helps out the primary physician. And it is, that's what we do. We are not always into the business of curing or fixing things. Hafiz, you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And this is the my contribution to the case was to call the palliative care and uh, and then ask for DNR. And this is very important because I see this, and I'm sorry to say this, I uh, I see this here and also in Bangladesh that we don't address this DNR issue. This patient goes into court CPR then gets intubated, it's a mess, and it's a bigger cost to the family without any 
uh, good outcome. Um, and also, I wanted to request you that um, uh, that that please uh, check the RR interval and then do as much as you can and best try to understand the mechanism of ventricular depolarization and mechanism of atrial depolarization. If you don't see any atria, at least try to figure out what is happening with the QRS complexes and the RR interval and change of axis. These are simple things. And don't let anyone intimidate you because of the EKG. Because you can do as much as you can, do as best as you can, know things better. And when you know better, then you do better. So um, this is sir, another patient. Sir, I have a question. Uh, yeah. In the previous ECG, so to yeah. Rafik, sir. Sir, it has been a teaching that when you see a very wide complex tachycardia, so which is called really wide regular tachycardia, you must exclude metabolic causes. So if we look at the ECG, though it is obvious that it could be VT, but if we see at the duration of the QRS, it's almost 200 milliseconds. And it said that if it is more than 180 milliseconds, that the ventricular tachycardia is don't go more on the side of the ventricular tachycardia. So what do you think? Yeah. Do we need to go more on the side of metabolic okay. cause or? No, 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 no. Absolutely. Let, let me answer. Let me, answer. Let, me answer. let me, yeah. because I work with the resident and the fellows and I understand the, the disease problem. So first identify what is this QRS widen and this tacky episode? What is the underlying cause? That is a different story. But find out what happening here. And is it a ventricular tachycardia or is it a, what is the differential of uh, white complex tachycardia? Just go through that rule because why regular white complex tachycardia, which I'm sure Rovik Bhai is going to give you a differential right now. But, but then if you think that this is a differential, find out the underlying etiology. But you cannot just jump by looking at the EKG, this is metabolic. But go by the rule book, the methodology that, what is this rhythm first? What is happening here? Perfect way. Yeah. So Shamir, you, you actually brought up a very nice point. But look at lead V2. There are sharp points in this ECG. Usually metabolic and electrolyte abnormality, you will, you will get what we call sine waves. So look at lead V2, there is a sharp point beginning and the end. Lead V1, there are sharp points. And these things point more towards less metabolic than, but of course I will remember that. Now, if it is metabolic, another problem is why will it happen suddenly, not happen with the other ECGs? So here I have both narrow and wide QRS. So that takes away, but of course, if I had, can you go to the Hafiz next ECG please? The same patient, next, there was another ECG. Yes. Now, okay, look at this. If I had just lead V3 all over the place, then I will be in trouble. I will say, wow, this looks like almost like a sine wave. But even then there are sharp points. There is a sharp tip. There is a sharp deflection on the downstroke. So yes, so the, if I just had lead V3 on a long rhythm strip, no question about it. But then again, in this one, I have both narrow and white QRS. So that takes away the metabolic part. Thank you. But that was a very good point. Thank you. And, and the issue is that even if you call it metabolic or whatnot, it is tachycardia, right? Look at the V3 in this EKG. It is wide complex tachycardia. So let's not, the question is, what is the probability of underlying issue? Is it hyperkalemia? If you have a suspicion, treat it, don't wait. And then is it a ischemic substrate? Address that. Is it a heart failure? Address that. So is it a scar related BT? Address that. That's the thing I'm trying to make that and stabilize the patient. And in this case, of course, the issue came out as the, uh, as the futility of care. So this is another patient with uh, right foot pain and then uh, other uh, issues with infection. 
came in with this EKG and there is this pacer spikes in the middle of tachycardia. Question is why there is pacer spikes in the middle of tachycardia? I tell the residents, particularly the residents, find out is the EKG sinus rhythm or not sinus rhythm if you see the P wave, tachycardia or bradycardia, white complex or narrow complex. Go with the simple and does it have a pattern? Is a bundle pattern or not bundle pattern? So I think sometimes we need to make it easy and, and then explain. If you jump on trying to explain, then you lose the obvious things and, and feels, it feels like for the residents, like intimidated. So I told them, look at this EKG, tachycardia, yes. Is it regular or irregular? Rules like there is little irregularity. So it looks like there is bundle pattern, most likely the bundle pattern, AFE. But then this is for the fellows. Why in the middle of the left AFE fast ventricular rate, there is a pacer spike. I actually added this one because I, I thought Rohit Bhai will not be here. But since Rohit Bhai is here, I added this one quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so you want me to talk about it or no? I don't know if, I, of course I want to talk, you want you to talk. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Rubik Bhai. So please remember one thing, the modern ECGs are actually um, electronic machines. They don't write direct things. First thing I have to make sure that this patient has a pacemaker because Modern, a lot of modern machines have tendency to put spikes when they, it doesn't present, it is not there. So first I look in the chart, does the patient have a pacemaker? It doesn't matter how much expert in pacing I am, doesn't matter much. Second would be if there is a pacemaker, what is happening if somebody has any supraventricular arrhythmia, <clears throat> it will track it before it mode switches. So it is possible that there is some kind of actual arrhythmia that was tracked and paced at a higher rate and then it mode switch and it no longer present because then it goes to a fixed rate pacer. And the problem that you're facing that you see these spikes only in V2, we don't see it in other leads. And it happens with pacemakers because nowadays with bipolar pacemaker with different kind of filtration, you don't see spikes. So please, um, that's it, thank you. Yeah, and is it possible that under sensing of the uh, HPL lead can give you? So the question is, can under-sensing of atrial lead do the spikes? Number one, the rate is 500, 480 millisecond. We don't program pacer rate, atrial rate that high. It can only happen if it is tracking something. So that is very, very unlikely. If we it were under sense and, and Ruby, I also do the math. I told the fellows to do the math that the pacer spike lead V2, I pointed out that RR interval is actually the upper limit of the pacer. So yes. that makes sense. Yes. And what is the chance that you will see two actual spike just before the KRS complex? The probability is very little. Yeah. So it's, not, it's a ventricular pacing. So we are running out of time. Let me finish this 57 year old uh, follow up in the clinic for left uh, lower extremity wounds and the uh, temperature high. And this is the EKG. Uh, this is a quick one. So, um, you know, Dr. Kundu presented this uh, EKG with the right ventricular hypertrophy P pulmonary fits in very well with the uh, mitral stenosis. Remarkably, that patient was in sinus rhythm with the mitral stenosis. But this patient has tall R wave and then the axis is left axis. Uh, but question is, uh, we read it as 
you know, atrial fibrillation and bifascicular block, um, will you call it right ventricular hypertrophy as well? With the right axis change, it's very difficult to tell something like that. Yeah. So uh, uh, what is that? <laughs> I love this. So the, it is more than seven millimeter in the V1. So you get tempted to call it right ventricular hypertrophy. However, the right axis is not deviated. So we don't know. But keep this in mind. Then you can do further evaluation. So EKG may not solve all problem, but just keep in, in your mind that there is an abnormality. And unlike the previous EKG, look at the AV segment on lead AVR. There is no ST elevation and ST elevation looks like the part of the QRS, not a separate ST segment elevation. And then the ST depression here, and I compared this with the previous, it's not as profound as before. So it is clinical context that is very important how you treat these patients. So this is another one with uh, endosteginal disease, fistula, PCI, bad cardiomyopathy, history of PE arrest in the past. Coming with this EKG, how you tackle this patient? Very regular, it seems. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <laughs> the STEMI was actually a big decision. So, one of the things the ER dogs do, Rafik Bhai knows in the US, if they cannot figure out, they call it a STEMI. And then you figure it out. <laughs> This was his baseline EKG in the past. No, 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 don't show the baseline. <laughs> stay back, stay back, please. Because that's the ECG that you're going to be faced with. Yeah. I wish I could, we could bring somebody from the audience, but there are very few people left. Um, just look at one lead, lead V1. After where it's written V1, there is a QRS complex, there is no P before that. But the next one, there is a P. And, but the PR is very short. And then there is nothing. And there is something after the QRS complex, which most likely is a P. So I think this ECG has evidence. Interesting part, if you look at lead one, it looks like typical left bundle blind block pattern. Um, yeah. But that is the clue to this ECG yeah. that I will call it a slow VT. So low VT, yeah. So, and then uh, go back, go to the next ECG, the one that baseline. Yeah. But this is a very good ECG, Hafiz, because yeah. if I could draw a P wave before the QRS, it will be typical left bundle, right? It will be very difficult to debate that out. Yeah. Yeah. Every decision is actually clue. Yeah. And okay, oh, so we're going to look, look at this. Can you go back, please? Please go back to that, that ECG. Can you go back again? Go back to the ECG. Yeah, this is the one. Can you see it? Uh, the one before that. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, look at lead V5, V6. Yeah. And actually, yeah. I, and, and I go to forward, please. Next one. Next so this ECG. is post post yeah, uh, next ECG. post uh, CRTD. Yeah, oh, it's a different patient. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. No, oh, fine, thank you. So this patient bad cardiomyopathy, biatrial enlargement, history of AFib. We actually did a CRTD after the uh, AV nodal ablation. Uh, I will finish with these two EKGs because these are very important ones. Um, I think for this. Uh, and we have a series of this. Uh, if the ER calls it as a STEMI, will you agree? Uh, 
again, the typical ST lesion is in only P1. And AVR? And that's why it is the ST depression mostly. AVR is ST lesion. As well. Yeah. So and then and the just, clinical just context will be much important here. Very, very important. And this is the thing in the US, some hospitals, they just call a STEMI and they, the cat lab stuff arrives before you come and then they, they take it to the cat lab. But I usually say, I explain to me that why I need to go to the cat lab, you know? So this man presented with uh, cardiac arrest, downtime 10 minutes. And then all these were given, epi, bicarb and all that. And uh, look at that potassium. Acidosis. And we need to follow that. It's totally metabolically deranged. And uh, the pH was bad. And usually pH less than 7.1, bad prognosis, bad prognosis, less than 6.9 should not go to the cat lab. And I can accept, and the fellows laugh at me, I have taken cases for 6.9, but I broke the rule because the clinical situation, no other explanation, downtime very short, and witnessed cardiac arrest, I kind of took the a patient, but generally do not take. This is another important thing. Yes. I think we should, we should stop here. It's 11 o'clock, okay. right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.